Um, so thank you guys for coming to my presentation today. We're, we're going to do uh, a crash course on how to develop uh, on L1, on Bitcoin's layer one. Um, you can do, there's a lot of stuff you can do there. And so I'm going to teach you all about some of it today uh, with this presentation I made called Bitcoin Script, the world's first smart contracting language. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, if you want to follow along, which I recommend you do, uh, you can pull up this um, URL right here. In fact, let me show you what happens if you do. If you just take this, which I will drop into the chat and paste it into your browser, it'll just take you right to this presentation. And I recommend you do that. I recommend you do pull this up. Uh, so let me put it in the chat because, um, link to the presentation, um, I recommend you do that because uh, we're going to be taking some, we're going to be doing a code along here and you're going to be building your first Bitcoin smart contract uh, with me today. Like this is going to be, if you've never done it before, this will be your first time and you can do everything. You don't need to download any, anything new. Well, you do need Bitcoin. Other than that, uh, you got everything you need. Uh, so the other thing we're going to do, I want to bring up this GitHub, which is called Learn Bitcoin Script. Uh, and I want to show you what we're going to build today. The final, the final product that we're going to make uh, is right here on this page. And look at this. Isn't this gorgeous? This is the perfect application. Just a, a blank page with no errors anywhere. Uh, no, everything that's in here is happening in the browser console. So if you go and open up um, your browser console right here, you can actually see um, some errors. There are some errors on this page. That's not good. What's, what's going on there? Well, friends, we may be having a wonderful time today because unexpectedly the demo is not working, but we're going to build it together. What's supposed to happen is it's supposed to create a smart contract address uh, where an Oracle can decide uh, who gets some money in a contract about a ball game. Um, so we're going to build it today and we'll find out why there are errors, uh, which I will fix after the, after this show. Um, but in the meantime, you can pull that up. And then also I want to mention a, uh, an IDE, an integrated development environment for interacting with Bitcoin, uh, is on this page. Uh, and you can switch from liquid over to Bitcoin right there. Uh, and then you can actually play around with like doing stuff with Bitcoin script. So, you know, you can add numbers. And you can do, uh, you know, op add to see what that looks like and stuff like that. And I would actually take the number one, add the number two to it and get three as a result. So you can kind of see some stuff happening there. We're going to be using that later in this, in this uh, thing. So you might want to pull those things up. Uh, but in the, it, once you all have, have that ready, uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to download Bitcoin Core. Uh, we're going to download Bitcoin Core so that we can create uh, so that we can use it, <clears throat> use a little Bitcoin testnet on your own machine um, to create a Bitcoin smart contract together. So I recommend you go, I'm going to show you how to do it. This will be different on different machines. If you're on like a Linux machine like I am, it'll be how I'm doing it. But if you're on a Windows or a Mac, you'll, follow, you'll you know, use those buttons. Uh, I'm on Linux, so I'm going to download, uh, I'm going to download the latest version of Bitcoin right into my downloads folder. And then... Uh, as soon as that is downloaded, uh, it's called Bitcoin 25. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to open up my terminal, go into my downloads folder, uh, go into Bitcoin 25. Oh, I got to unzip it. In Linux, we use tar instead of zip. Well, sometimes we use zip, um, but today I'm using tar to, uh, that, that's an equivalent of zip. So I just unzipped that directory. Now I'm going to uh, remove the um, remove the tar file, or the zip file. Go into the Bitcoin directory, and we've got a couple of subdirectories in here, including um, including bin, <clears throat> which is the binaries or the, the actual program, a configuration file, and some other stuff. I'm going to go into the bin folder, and uh, this is the one I want, the one that says Bitcoin Qt uh, or Bitcoin Qt. That is the, a graphical user interface for using Bitcoin and you can just run it using these flags. So if you're on Windows, the procedure is going to be a little bit different. You'll probably not need a zip file. Um, you'll just be able to download the application right away. And I think in order to make it run in reg test mode, that'll put a test net on your machine. I think you'll have to like modify the, uh, the desktop uh, icon. Um, but yeah, you can just Google how to run Bitcoin in reg test mode 
and follow the instructions if you want to follow along here, uh, which I recommend you do because we're going to need Bitcoin to do this. And it's better to use it on, on a testnet than use it on the mainnet where it costs a lot of money to do this stuff. I'm also going to run it in daemon mode. I'm going to turn on something called TX index, which gives us, which indexes all the transactions that are created, makes it easier to program. Uh, and then we'll just run it. So this is what it looks like when you run Bitcoin. This is a fresh new installation of it, and it says, welcome to Bitcoin Core. It invites me to um, choose where I want to store my data. I'll just use the defaults. And here I am it, with Bitcoin running in reg test mode. You can see how it says right up there, reg test. I've got a little test net on my machine. Uh, it says that I'm, it, it, it thinks it's 12 years ago. It thinks Bitcoin just started. You know, it thinks it's J January, 2009, um, but we can easily, uh, go into our console and uh, and well actually we need to create a wallet first let's create a wallet called test and then we can catch it up quickly by just mining a block so I'm gonna do get new address there's a little address I got and then um, generate two address one block bam now it's all caught up and it realizes it's today so and we've got 50 bitcoins in our wallet right there so uh, you've all, you should, I hope you all have Bitcoin Core running <clears throat> in reg test mode because we're going to use it. Uh, I'm also going to generate 100 blocks because you can't spend any coins until after 100 blocks have passed. So just uh, generated 100 blocks and now we're very rich and we have loads of, loads of Bitcoin, loads of fake you know, testnet Bitcoin on our machine to use, 5,050 Bitcoins. Okay, so we've all got Bitcoin Core running. We're all ready to make a smart contract. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how smart contracts work in Bitcoin now. Um, so what is Bitcoin Script? Well, Bitcoin Script is this wonderful programming language that was created uh, by Satoshi for, the, for creating uh, contracts in Bitcoin. It uses a concept called locking scripts and unlocking scripts to do, well, contracts. Uh, and these scripts are made of text. So ordinarily in Bitcoin, we think of you know, Bitcoin working like this. Bob here, he has, he has some Bitcoins, right? That's, uh, that's, that's what he's got, he's got some money and he wants to send some of it to Alice. So he types in Alice's Bitcoin address, right? And he fires off some money and, uh, and that's it. The Bitcoin goes to Alice's wallet and Alice has the money now. We like to think, you know, that's how Bitcoin works and that's how most um, wallets will try to present it to you to make it seem easy and familiar because that's how things like PayPal work and that's how things like, um, uh, I don't know, Venmo work. Uh, however, as indicated by the X here, that's actually not how Bitcoin works. That is just an analogy or, um, or a, a visual attempt to emulate more familiar software. How Bitcoin scripts actually work, or how Bitcoin actually works, uh, has a reversed flow. Um, the first thing that happens when you want to send somebody money uh, is that that person has to create something called a locking script, uh, which I represent with a little padlock over here. Usually it's their public key. They, they make a locking script that says only the person with this public key can unlock, can, can spend this money. And so Alice over, over here, she's got her private key off to the side and she creates this locking script, this padlock uh, that she gives to Bob. You know, that's when you show somebody your Bitcoin address, you're, you're actually showing them a locking script. And then Bob's wallet will take some of his Bitcoins and snap that padlock onto him, right? It'll say, okay, this, these coins are locked to this little padlock here. And now, because Alice has the private key, only she is able to stick that in and unlock, you know, unlock the uh, padlock and, and free the Bitcoins so that she can spend them. That's actually how Bitcoin scripts work. It's, it's the reverse of normal. Alice acts first. She creates a locking script, she presents it to you, and then you can send money. Well, you, you're not actually sending money, you're just locking it up so that only she has the key. Um, but all of this, even this lock and key analogy, that's also just an analogy, right? Uh, there is no actual padlock, there is no actual key, everything's just text. The lock is text, you know, that's your Bitcoin address. Your private key, that's just text stored by your, you know, by your computer. But it's able to, uh, your, your computer is able to run a program that can use this one piece of text to um, satisfy the conditions of this other piece of text. And it's kind of like a lock and a key. Um, so that's what Bitcoin Script does. Whenever we're making contracts in Bitcoin, you have to keep in mind, what we're doing is we're creating very complicated padlocks. We're creating very complicated padlocks with complicated keys. Uh, and, and that's what a smart contract is. 
Um, how do we go from Bitcoin scripts to what we are more familiar with in terms of smart contracts? Well, um, so this is fr comes from Nick Zabo, who is possibly the inventor of smart contracts. Uh, in 1996, before any of this stuff existed, he wrote about how we could do smart contracts if we had digital money. Uh, and he defined a smart contract as a set of promises specified in digital form, including protocols within which the parties perform on these promises. I always find this sentence of his a little bit, a little bit confusing. Um, the first part's easy. A smart contract is a set of promises specified in digital form. That part's easy. I get that because all contracts are promises. Like I will do this, and then you will get this result, or or you will do that, and and then this will happen. They're, they're all they're always promises. But of course, a smart contract is a digital promise. We we write it down on like uh, on like a blockchain somewhere. So that part makes sense. It's a digital promise. Uh, but then this second part, including protocols within which the parties perform on these promises, it uses some weird grammar. Um, I, w I wonder, I, sometimes I wonder if Nick Zabo, English maybe, might have been his second language. Uh, but another word for, or another way to express this is that um, software enforces the rules. Uh, software enforces the contract. Uh, your wallet will do it, you know, or, or um, you know, the, the, the network of nodes will, will perform, will, will execute the contract. Um, so yeah, that's a smart contract is a digital contract and then software enfor that's enforced by software. The primitive ancestor of smart contracts, he says in the same paper, is the humble vending machine. And this is interesting. I uh, did some research on vending machines in preparation for this talk. And one thing I found out is that the ancient Greeks had them. Uh, there was an ancient Greek inventor named Hero, uh, I think it was H-I-R-O, of Alexandria. Uh, and he lived in a temple. Well, I don't know if he lived there. He worked at a temple. And he made a vending machine. Um, he made he took some holy water and he put it in a vessel and he made it so that if you put a coin into this vessel, uh, it would drop down onto a little plate, and the plate was attached to a lever, so it would it would drop when the coin landed on it, and the lever would would move up and open up a valve, which would let some holy water out. But then, because it was tilted now, the coin would slide off of the the plate. And a spring would go back up and shut and shut the valve again. And so you'd only, you know, if you put in a coin, you would get a little bit of wa holy water, and then it would shut off again. So it's interesting. The ancient Greeks actually had a, had a vending machine. But what's interesting about them and why they're an ancestor of smart contracts is that in order to use a vending machine, you effectively have you're, you've created a promise. You've created a device that will enforce a promise. Uh, the promise in the case of a vending machine is like if you put in the right amount of money, you will get your snack or your or your water. Um, and that, that promise doesn't need a human to come around and enforce it. The, the machine itself, the hardware itself, you know, the spring and the lever will enforce that contract for you. Um, so that, that's an interesting property of these things. And, and the, what Nick Zabo envisioned was that a smart contract would take that same design but make it so that software enforces uh, the logic of the contract instead of, instead of hardware. Uh, and so that's the idea of a smart contract is we want to create a situation where a piece of software will enforce a contract and and, ca and, and cause something to happen, um, uh, which is neat. So I want to use a little bit more. I want to go into this analogy a little bit more and apply it to Bitcoin um, because a, a vending machine is sort of like a very complicated padlock. I mean, it's a really big one, but when you put something in a vending machine, it's kind of like putting it in a, in a box that has, that has a lock on it, right? Like most of these things, you can't just open the door and take them out. Uh, you've got to have the right key. But these complicated pad, padlocks, the vending machines, the key is a little different. The key is like the, the size and shape and weight of a coin. Uh, and that key you put it in will then, cause, will then trigger a mechanism that um, uh, uh, unlocks like a portion of what's inside. You know, it'll, it'll make one snack drop into the vent, into the thing below, the, uh, the unlocked portion. So uh, if you think of a vending machine as a really complicated padlock uh, and a coin as, uh, as a key that you can put into them, we can use that as an analogy for uh, how Bitcoin smart contracts work. We're going to lock up our Bitcoin inside of a vending machine and then someone else, you know, Alice over here, she has to have the right piece of text didn't mean to do that. She has to have the right piece of text, uh, the the authorization or, or the the ability to um, insert something into our little vending machine, into our into our piece of text, that'll cause our Bitcoin to become unlocked. Um, so that's that's another analogy for what Bitcoins are. They are advanced digital smart contracts, or they are advanced digital padlocks, 
uh, for which there is uh, a set of one or more pieces of text that can unlock them. Uh, some of the things you can do with smart contracts in Bitcoin, uh, the most common thing we do with them is, is we use proofs of purchase. This is the Lightning Network gives you a proof of purchase, for example, every time you buy something. Um, so a proof of purchase works like this. You get a coin if and only if I get a receipt. Uh, and so typically I will, I will lock up some Bitcoin into a thing that says, you know, the piece of text you have to supply me with in order to get this coin. Uh, it's not just your, uh, your key, but it's also a receipt. You also have to say, you know, um, I owe you a piece of gum or, or whatever, uh, or you have purchased a piece of gum. And once you stick that piece of text in along with your key, then the coin unlocks and you can get your, get your item out. Um, so proofs of purchase are pr pretty much the most common thing we use in Bitcoin for, uh, for smart contracts because you know, it, is, it is designed to be a payment network and that's a pretty important part. Uh, a very common thing you can do with them also is make tokens. Uh, in Bitcoin, one of the things you can do is since you can put text on the blockchain, you can mark an address as being special somehow uh, and then treat the sats that are in that address differently. Um, like you could say any sats that go into this address are red coins. And so once I send them to you, you can actually track on the blockchain that these are red coins and they, maybe they have some extra value. Like Tether did this with Bitcoin. They, they issued the first um, stable coins on Bitcoin by just marking an address as special. And then if they sent money to or from that address, they counted as tethers. Um, and they would do like small amounts of Bitcoin for that. Uh, one another thing you can do is swaps. These are pretty common. Um, you can, where, where I say you can get X amount of coin A if and only if I get Y amount of coin B. You can do that with tokens, but you can also do it with cross blockchain stuff. Uh, so you can make it so that like you have to put in uh, your, the actual private key to some coins you hold in another chain. Uh, and then once you give me that private key, I can sweep them on that other chain. But simultaneously by putting in that private key on Bitcoin, you also got, got the Bitcoins. Uh, so sw you can do cross-chain swaps as well as token swaps uh, using the smart contracts in Bitcoin. Uh, three, two other things you can do. Uh, you can do elections, ball games, and escrow. And this is actually what we'll be doing today. I'm going to show you how to build, an, build a, a, a ball game contract uh, where we're going to have a guy up here. Uh, this, this little guy in green, he's going to be an oracle. Uh, and he's going to have a key for, a, for an, uh, he's going to know about an upcoming game between the Packers and the Saints and he's gonna create a key for each one of these. And we're gonna have a Bitcoin locked up with three padlocks, uh, one belonging to this guy, one belonging to this lady, uh, and then the missing key is gonna be provided by this Oracle over here. So one of these guys is gonna get bet the Packers will win, one of this, the other one's gonna bet the Saints will win, and uh, you'll, you'll need two keys. You'll need, you know, he will need his own key plus you know, the Packers key, and she'll need her own key plus the Saints key. And so when then the Oracle is going to reveal one of them and allow whichever one he picks to, um, to get the money um, based on whoever won the ball game. So that's the actual contract we're going to build today, but that's something you can do with Bitcoin. You can get a coin, you can make it so that you get a coin if and only if someone you trust says A or I get a coin if they say B. Um, th we use that for escrow, we use that for, you, you could use it for elections and stuff. You'd bet on who's gonna win an election. Um, and then we have lotteries. Bitcoin can do random numbers, and since Bitcoin can do random numbers, uh, you don't actually need a third party for to do a lottery. You can just have you can just assign every player uh, a number one through n, like ha all come to consensus on what everyone's numbers is, uh, and then they reveal they they pick a number one through n and reveal it, and then you do some um, addition on these numbers and take the modulus, and then the winner is whoever's number comes up. So you can do lotteries and coin flips and stuff without needing a third party because Bitcoin can do random numbers. Um, it's actually really good at random numbers. Um, we do them all the time. We love random numbers in Bitcoin. They're everything. They're your public key, they're your private key, they're the block header. Bitcoin loves random numbers. Anyway, these are some examples of things that I personally have built. Uh, I've, done, I've definitely built proofs of purchase, tokens, swaps, elections. I'm going to build a ball game contract with you today. Uh, lotteries. There's a whole lot of stuff you can build uh, just natively using using Bitcoin. Um, but let's talk about some of the built-in functions of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin's programming language is called Bitcoin Script, and these are the these are not all the functions it has, but these are the ones that I most frequently use personally. 
Uh, I really often use the ch signature functions. Like that's that's how you ensure that only only one person or only one from a set of people can spend some money is by using check sig and check multi sig. Uh, check multi sig also allows you to do stuff like voting, where you can have people vote on uh, on you know and only if fifty one percent of the people say it should go here, and then you have that happen. You can use check multi sig for that. I love the password functions. I call them password functions. Normal people call them hashing functions. Uh, but you can take some, you can take a secret and hash it, and then say, you know, you can only spend this money if you know the secret, uh, the secret that hashes to this value. I think of it as a password essentially. I, I'm gonna, you, you can only spend this money if you know the password um, to it. Um, so I, I like those functions. We're gonna use one of those today. We're gonna use this one, hash 160. Uh, we have time functions. We have check lock time value and check sequence value. Um, those or check lock. Lock time verify and check sequence verify. Uh, those both are uh, forms of time lock. Uh, see, LTV is an absolute time lock where you say something like, um, I'm going to put some money in an address and you can only spend it after January 1st. Like, no matter when I put money in that address, it's only spendable after January 1st. Uh, and then a, a check sequence verify is a relative version of that where you say, I don't know when I'm going to put money into this address. It might be today or it might be three years from now, but when I do, once the money goes into there, you have to wait two weeks. You know, so, so you might be able to spend it two weeks from now if I put it in right now, or if I put it in three years from now, you'll have to wait three years and two weeks to, to spend it because you just, you just have to wait two weeks once it goes into the thing, once it goes into the address. So we have both of those forms of time locks. Those are pretty commonly used to make smart contracts. We have mathematical functions, add addition, subtraction, checking if a number is greater than a number or less than another number. We have an equality checker, and this one also works on strings, um, so not, not just integers, but you can also check if two strings are the same. We have stack functions. In Bitcoin script, stacks are kind of like arrays, if you're familiar, well, they're, they're exactly like arrays. If you're familiar with, you know, JavaScript arrays or Python arrays, stacks are the same thing. Um, you can duplicate an element that's, on an, that's in an array. You can drop an element from an array, um, which would be the equivalent to pop on, in JavaScript. Uh, you can swap elements in an array. You can rotate them. You can like shuffle things from the back to the front, um, or just like you know, move everything in a cycle. Uh, you can check how deep an array is, or, or how deep a stack is. We call it with the, with the depth function. Uh, that's kind of like array dot length in JavaScript. Um, and in Bitcoin, everything goes onto a stack. There's there's nothing uh, when you when you use a Bitcoin script, uh, all of your functions are on a stack. And all of the inputs to those functions also are on a stack. So everything's on, everything uses arrays. Um, and then we've got Boolean functions, and, or, not, nand, nor, xor, and xnor. Uh, these, to me, are my favorite Bitcoin script functions because these are the building blocks of um, circuit boards. You can actually design a circuit board in Bitcoin script and run arbitrary computations on it. Uh, and I've done that. I've actually built uh, circuit boards in Bitcoin script so that I could run arbitrary computations which is kind of fun. The Boolean functions are, are great. Uh, and then we've got branching logic, if then else, verify and return. Everyone should be familiar with if then else, uh, that is known as AI these days. <laughs> we just string together a bunch of if statements. I'm just kidding, that's not how they work. Um, but uh, yeah, if then else is, allows you to have branching logic where you're like, you know, if, if this condition is true, then run this set of this, this script, and if it's not, then run this other one. Um, and then we've got verify and return. Verify says like only continue if the previous function returned true. Uh, so you can write a function that does like, I don't know, a coin flip or something. And then you say only if the coin flip landed on heads, you know, you verify that and then you can proceed. If it landed on, on tails, you know, if, or if it landed on zero, uh, then you, you stop, you stop the script. And verify will do that for you. It'll make sure that the previous function did what you want before you continue. Uh, and then we have return, which is like the opposite of verify. If you encounter uh, return in a Bitcoin script, um, it, it stops execution and, and just fails the transaction. Uh, so you can use that to say like, you know, never go down this path. I, I never want you to go down this path. I'm going to put a return on it and then your script will never, you know, do this dangerous thing. Um, so these are not all of the functions Bitcoin has. These are just the ones that I most commonly use. If you want a full list of the functions that are available in Bitcoin script, you can check out this, this page right here, uh, and that'll give you all of the, all the nitty gritty details. Okay, let's talk about some gotchas. If you're gonna be developing on L1, 
uh, there's some things to be aware of, some things that are unique and, and challenging about Bitcoin script. One of them is you can't give custom names to your variables or your functions. You can have variables and you can have functions, but you can't name them. Um, so normally in a programming language, you, if you wanted to do a coin flip, you might write a function called coin flip, and you would take inputs of you know Alice's flip and Bob's flip, and then do something with those. Um, but you can't do that in Bitcoin. You can write the function, uh, or, and after you've written your function in a normal programming language, you would then call it wherever you want. Um, but you can't do that in Bitcoin. You can write a function, uh, but it's it's not going to have a name. Uh, it just is a list of ex of, of um, op codes, or operation codes, or functions that you want to run. Um, so you, some of the it, it, you, functions are all a list of built-in functions. So like you can compile a list of you know do check sig and then do some addition and do and then do and swap some things. That that might be a function in Bitcoin, or, you know a user-defined function, but it wouldn't have a name. It'd just be a list of the, some of the built-in functions. Um, you can, however, add comments. You can kind of get around this by adding comments to your code. So you can say like, even though this doesn't actually have a name, from from line five to line two hundred. You know, that's all a function that I'm going to call whatever. Uh, and then your function doesn't actually have a name, but it's got a comment above it that can kind of help you keep track of where it is. Uh, you can do that with variables as well. You can just add comments above them to say what they're doing. Um, so there are some script compilers, Bitcoin lib and Bitcoin JS and Minsk, uh, min.sc. That's actually a website. You can go there. And they uh, are higher level languages that, that give you stuff like named variables and named functions, and then they compile, compile down to Bitcoin script. Um, I use Bitcoin JS all the time. Minsk is not complete yet, but it's, it, it reminds me of Bash. It looks a lot like Bash. Uh, and I actually really, I really like the way it looks, but it doesn't fully work yet. Uh, Bitcoin lib is great. I use that one all the time. We're going to use it today. Uh, another thing you can't do with Bitcoin is you can't write a function once and call it twice. So if you do a coin flip function uh, and you want to have like five coin flips, you've got to copy paste your code five times. You know, you've got to write, write that function of 100 lines or whatever and then copy paste it wherever you want to do it. In a normal programming language, you could write it once and then call the coin flip function you know, five times later on and that would be more efficient. But Bitcoin doesn't let you do that. You've, got, you've just got to write a function once and call it twice or call it however many times you, or you've got to write a function five times if you want to call it five times. Um, you can use these, you can, like Bitcoin script, Bitcoin JS lets you like, you know, it, when it compiles it, it'll, it'll paste it multiple times for you if you wanted to do that. But, um, but yeah, once it gets down to Bitcoin, it's actually written out sequentially. Uh, another gotcha, if you ever want to do anything with big numbers, Bitcoin doesn't have very big numbers. The maximum size of an integer in Bitcoin is this. Uh, everything above that is a string. And the maximum negative size is negative this, uh, and everything below that is considered a string in Bitcoin. And of course, the difference between strings and integers, just like with ordinary programming languages, you can do mathematics on integers. Uh, you can add and subtract them and stuff like that, but you can't with strings. If you try to add a string to another string, it'll concatenate it instead, uh, which is, well, actually in Bitcoin, we don't have concatenate, so it'll just throw an error. If you try to add two strings together, Bitcoin will be like, these aren't integers, error, uh, failed transaction. So integers and strings must all be passed in as hex. Uh, you have to use hex a lot in Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin JS, as we'll see later, has uh, some helpers for that. Uh, so it'll turn things into hex for you under certain conditions. But everything has to be passed in as hex. Bitcoin script loves hex, uh, except for the number 0 through 16. Uh, the zero, numbers 0 through 16 are special. They have their own op codes. And uh, those are op 0 through op 16. You can put those in, and then the, those don't get passed in as hex. In fact, if you do pass them in as hex, it's invalid. <laughs> they, they won't work. Um, the Bitcoin will get mad at you. Well, it's, it's, I shouldn't say invalid. Uh, it's non-standard and people won't relay it for you. Uh, okay, so those are some of the gotchas. And the last gotcha I want to warn you about is if then else, which is weird in Bitcoin script. So over here, I've got an example of how a normal programming language does, um, uh, does if then else. And they try to, normal programming languages fall, try to follow how natural language would do it. Um, so here we've got if condition one happens or condition two happens, then you check Alice's signature. Uh, otherwise, you check Bob's signature. Uh, this 
double pipe here is in, at least in JavaScript and Python, that's an OR operator. I think it's pretty common for that to be an OR operator in lots of programming languages. So that's how normal programming languages follow the patterns of human speech. If you do this, then do this, otherwise do this. Um, Bitcoin's different. Here's the equivalent version of that in Bitcoin script. Uh, and you've got a one and a zero, one after the other, and then op or. So already it's different. Like the, 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 the two conditions actually come first before, before the if statement. Uh, and then you do an or after them. Like that's already weird. Uh, but then after you've figured out whether you're gonna, whether, which condition you're using, then you run an if on it. Uh, and if it's a one, it'll run this. And if it's a zero, it'll run this. It'll run the second one. Um, but then we also have like Yoda speech in Bitcoin, where instead of saying, you know, check Alice's pub key, it's like, here's Alice's pub key, now check the signature on it. You know, here's Bob's pub key, now check the signature on it. Uh, like Yoda always puts the verb last, and Bitcoin script does too. We put the functions after everything else. Um, so Bitcoin's a little different in this way. Also, in a normal programming language, condition one and condition two could both be functions themselves. Not so in Bitcoin. The only thing you can have as input to an if statement is a zero or a one. One will trigger the first condition and zero will trigger the other one. Uh, op or here will we'll compare the one and the zero and then if either of them is a one, it'll, it'll result in a one on the stack. Or if, if both of them are a zero, then it'll result in a zero on the stack and that'll be the input to the if statement. So if then else is a little weird in Bitcoin. Um, and you got to be aware of that when you're designing it. Every, everything in Bitcoin is like done with Yoda speech, where the where the f function comes last and all of its inputs come first. So that's weird because normal programming languages let you like have parentheses, parentheses and put them as parameters. But you just have to get used to it. That's Bitcoin works this way. Um, okay, so those are some gotchas. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to design our first Bitcoin script. So hopefully you've all got Bitcoin Core running now. And let's do it. Let's make a ball game contract with each other. Um, I'm going to do this in the browser. Uh, and uh, I like to program in the browser because that means everyone can, everyone's got a browser and you can all participate with me. Uh, and you don't have to download like a special IDE or anything. Uh, but in order to, down, to do stuff in the browser, the first thing I'm going to do is make a new folder. And then I'm going to do, um, I'm going to call it test contract. Well, test smart contract, that's what I'll call it. We're going to make a folder called test smart contract and inside let's create an index.html file index.html all right i'm going to open that up in a text editor uh, you don't have to use sublime you can use whatever text editor you want um, I, i'm using sublime because i like it but you can use visual studio if you like you can use microsoft notepad whatever you're comfortable editing text in uh, and then copy the code from here uh, the html and paste it in. And now if we open this up in our browser, we should see a blank page. And if we open up our developer console by going to more tools, browser console, uh, we shouldn't have any errors, um, but there are errors. This is annoying. I think these errors are, are created by like extensions that I have, because I've got no JavaScript running on this page and yet I'm seeing errors. Let me try this in a different browser. Uh, I will open this up in uh, Chrome instead. And then maybe Chrome won't show me any errors in here. More tools, uh, developer tools, console. Yeah, now I've got no errors. Okay, so gotta, I'm gonna go back to my uh, slideshow because I accidentally closed out of it when I did that. Uh, Learn Bitcoin script. And okay, so now we've got our we've got our page open in a browser. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add, we're going to modify its head. Uh, so copy this code, paste it in where your current head is, just replace what you've got there. And we've added some libraries. We've added the Bitcoin JS library, which we're going to use because we're, that's uh, a really excellent tool for creating Bitcoin smart contracts. Uh, we've added the buffer library. Um, JavaScript is kind of like Bitcoin in that integers can only be a certain size. I think it's like 4 billion or something with, with JavaScript, um, which is much bigger than Bitcoin lets you do. Whatever it is is much bigger than Bitcoin. 
But uh, we use the buffer library in JavaScript to let us deal with larger numbers, which you need to if you're going to deal with private keys and public keys because they're massive. Uh, and then there's var variable unsigned integers for Bitcoin. This is the stupidest thing in Bitcoin, and I'm going to rant about it later in this in this lesson. But you just you need it to do something stupid, and so I'll, I'll go into that later. But for now, just pop it into your code, and we'll keep on moving. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to pop some script tags in to our code, and this is going to form the basis of our of our contract here. I've decided to put this code into my body because JavaScript doesn't care whether you put stuff in the head or the body. It'll run it just fine, uh, but I want this one in my body. Uh, so what does this code do? Well, let me zoom in for you. We're going to create a variable called Alice. We're going to use Bitcoin JS to create a key pair for her, uh, a public key and a private key. We're going to assign the private key to Alice Priv and the public key to Alice Pub, and then we're going to log in our console Alice's public key. Then we're going to do the same thing for Bob. We're going to create a private key and a public key for him, and we're going to log his public key. Uh, after that, we're going to create two hashes, uh, something called the Packers hash and something called the Saints hash. Our smart contract is going to be based on a, a ball game. Uh, an up, we're going to pretend there's an upcoming ball game between the Packers and the Saints. And we're going to pretend that ESPN is our oracle. And ESPN has created a secret that hashes to this value. Uh, and they're going to call that the, the Packers secret. Then they've created a secret that hashes to this value. And they're going to call that the Saints secret. And that's going to be the, effectively the third key in our contract. Alice and Bob are going to create a Bitcoin address where one of them gets to spend it, but only if they learn you know, Alice can only spend it if she learns the Packers secret, and Bob can only spend it if he learns the Saints secret. And we're gonna use these hashes to check if they know the secret. So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, let's refresh our code and see if there are any errors. And there are no errors, but what we do get, check this out, is we get some public keys. We can see Alice's public key in here, and we can see Bob's pub key. And they've both just been created. Awesome, so things are working. Things are, things are actually running fine. I was worried when it didn't work earlier, but I think it was just an extension was throwing some kind of error. Um, so doing it in this browser is better. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to create our script. Um, so let me do this. And we'll pop that right into here, a new script tag. Uh, this is the ball game script. It's going to take Alice's pub key and Bob's pub key as input. It's going to take both of these Packers hashes, and it's going to create a Bitcoin script for us. And this Bitcoin script says, um, if we take our secret and hash it, and it matches the Packers hash, uh, we're going to check that they match with op equal verify, and then we're going to let Alice spend the money. We're going to have her pop in her signature and check that it's valid. And as long as she provides a valid signature and she knows the Packers hash, she gets to spend the money. Or if we if we trigger the else condition, then we're going to take uh, we're going to take the secret provided by Bob, check if it's equivalent to the Saints hash. And if it is, then we're going to check Bob's signature and allow Bob to spend the money. Uh, and then we're going to end. We're going to end the script because that's all it does. It just says, if you know this secret, you, Alice can spend the money. Or if we know the other secret, Bob can spend the money. And then an Oracle, ESPN, can provide the secret. Uh, so that's how our ball game contract is going to work. Now we've got it in script format. All we've got to do now is run it right here. And we should see our smart contract pop out in our console. So here we go. Pop in this code. Let me indent it. I like things to be indented properly. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we're going to have we're creating a function called ball game, which is going to create a pay to witness script hash uh, script. That's a that's what we call that's one way to do scripts in Bitcoin is with pay to witness script hash. It's type of Bitcoin address. We're going to create this address by calling our ball game script, which is just going to take in create this function, uh, create this Bitcoin script function and turn it into a Bitcoin address. And then we're going to log that Bitcoin address, um, return the pay to witness script hash address. Uh, so let's just run this. When we, when we run ball game contract, we're gonna pass in all these variables that we, create, we created you know, up here. And we should see a smart contract address come out. So let's refresh our page and there it is. There's our Bitcoin smart contract. This, this Bitcoin address, if we send any money to it, um, Alice will be able to spend it if she learns the Packers secret, and Bob will be able to spend it if he learns the Saints secret. Um, so we're going to do that. We're going to send some money to this, but I do want to show you what happens if we refresh. Notice that the address ends in 6MQVSA. If we refresh, it changes to XF7CZ. 
Uh, and if we refresh it again, it'll change again. Every time we refresh this page, the smart contract changes. This is different from if you're, if you're familiar with working in something like Ethereum. Once you've made a contract in Ethereum, it stays the same. And that's because you put the smart contract on the blockchain, which doesn't change, uh, and, or you know, confirmed blocks never change. And so the smart contract address stays the same every time. In Bitcoin, we do things differently. Um, we're putting Alice's pub key and Bob's pub key, they're part of this smart contract. You can actually see um, right here, um, right here, Alice pub, Bob pub. And because their public keys are part of this, uh, every time I change their public key, the smart contract changes because it includes their public keys. So every time I refresh, you know, I'm not saving their public keys anywhere. It's just making new ones for them every time. And consequently, the smart contract changes every time. Uh, okay, so we're about to send some money to this, um, but I want to go over how Bitcoin's uh, stack works. Before we, before we actually run this program, I want to show you a visual representation of Bitcoin's um, virtual machine and how it operates. Okay, so this over here is going to be, I think of it as a bucket. Uh, this is actually a stack though, and we're going to take items from our art, from our, we're going to take items from the argument section, pop them into the stack, and then run our program on them. Um, but the, the virtual machine has a, has a set of operations that it, that it uses. Uh, and the, the current operation, whenever you start a Bitcoin script, its current operation, the first thing it does is it checks the arguments section and tries to find any strings or numbers that are on this stack. And if there are any, it's going to pop them into this stack over here, which is the execution stack. So we'll just see that it says, okay, I looked in arguments, I found a signature, so I'm going to pop that signature into the execution stack. The next thing it's going to do is it's going to do that again. It's going to look in the argument section, check if there are any strings and numbers. It found pub key there, and so it puts pub key onto the execution stack. The next thing it does, well, there are no strings or numbers anymore in the argument section, so it's going to move up to the program section and look there. Well, there are no strings or numbers up here in the program section either, but there is a function. There's a dupe function. So the next operation the virtual machine does, if there are no strings or numbers here or here, then it's going to run a function, if any. Um, so it finds a function called dupe, and it's going to put dupe into the current operation. What does dupe do? Well, dupe takes one element from the stack, that's the pub key in this case. It's going to copy that, and it's going to put, uh, both, well, it's going to put both copies onto the stack. So it pops in pub key onto here. Uh, it's going to copy pub key. Right there, so now there are two pub keys, and then it's going to put both of them on the stack. That's what dupe does. Now it's done with dupe, so it's going to go back to its regular mode of operation. Check the arguments, see if there are any, any arguments here, strings or numbers, put them on the stack. There are none. Move up here to the program, are there any strings or numbers? Nope, there are no strings or numbers. So then, if there are no strings or numbers, run a function. Well, there is, there's a hash function. So it's going to pop the hash function down into here. What does the hash function do? It takes one element from the execution stack, that's this public key, and then it's going to hash it, it's going to turn it into key hash, and it's going to put the key hash onto the stack where the pub key was. That's the hash function. Now it's done with that. Move back to your regular mode of operation. Check if there are any strings or numbers in the arguments. There are none. Check if there are any strings or numbers up here. There is one. There's the, word, there's the phrase key hash. That's up here in the program. So it's going to pop key hash onto the stack. Uh, then it goes back to its regular mode of operation. Check if there are any strings or numbers in the arguments section. There are none. So it goes up here. Check if there are any numbers or strings up here. There are none. Okay, then it's going to run a function if there is one. Well, there is one. There's equal verify. So what does equal verify do? It checks if two elements are the same and fails if not. So it takes key, the both key hashes and checks if they're the same and it fails if they're not. Equal verify is actually a combination of two functions. Equal is one function in Bitcoin, and verify is another. So if we were using them separately, um, if we were using equal and then verify, it would check if these two things are equal, and then it would put a one on the stack, and then, it would, and then the verify function would just check if the top element is a one, uh, and if it is a one, it will continue, otherwise it will fail. Uh, but we actually combine those into equal, equal verify one function which just checks if two things are equal and fails if they're not. But in this case, they are, so they're consumed, nothing's put on the stack, and we just continue. Check if there are any strings or numbers here, there are none. Check if there are any strings or numbers here, there are none. Okay, so we'll run a function called checksig. Uh, checksig checks, takes a signature and a public key as input, checks if the signature is valid for that public key, and returns a one if they are. Uh, so it'll put those on the 
it'll put those into the current operation, check if it's valid, uh, and if it is, if they are, in this case they are, so it'll put a one on the stack. Then it goes back to its regular mode of operation, check if there are any strings or arguments, there are none here, check if there are any in the program, there are none there, then if there aren't, then run a function, if any, but oh no, there are no functions in the program, so the, the program has terminated. And once the program terminates, all that needs to happen is if there's a one, if there's a single one on the execution stack, the program succeeds. If so there is, there is a single one there because our check sig put one there. So the program will succeed. If it was anything else, uh, it was a zero, for example, uh, the program would fail and would not, would not go forward. So that is how Bitcoin's virtual machine operates. It just, it's a loop. It just keeps on checking for things here, checking for things here, and running any functions it sees until it, it's finished. And then it wants there to be a single one on the execution stack, uh, and that'll make it work. Okay, so that is what our function, you know, our simple little if-else function's gotta do. It's gotta end up with just a single one on the stack. Uh, last thing is the part where I rant. <laughs> Then we've got a function here called witness stack to script witness. And I do not like this function. I'm gonna pop it directly into my console and hit enter. And let me tell you what this witness stack to script witness thing does. It is terrible. Um, this uses the variable unsigned integer that I defined, that I told you about before. In Bitcoin script, whenever you put something on the stack, you have to say how long that thing is. Uh, if it's a hash, for example, that's always 32 bytes. So you have to prefix 32 bytes um, before whatever it is that you're running. Um, Bitcoin JS will do that for you in most cases, but there's one thing it won't do on its own, which is the entire script. Your entire script, you have to say how long that is. Uh, and Bitcoin JS won't do that for you. So we have this function called witness stack to script witness, which does that. And since, it's a, since your script can be a variable size, it has to be a variable unsigned integer. Uh, and it'll pop that onto the thing. And I just hate this. Like Satoshi was such an engineer who wanted to be so precise about everything. Like, let's make sure you specify how long everything is and let's specify even how long the script itself is. Just a madman. Anyway, I don't like this function because it's ugly and it's horrible, but you need it. And so you just pop it into your code and it'll tell you how long your script is. Okay, so we got that in there. Uh, now we have to run our function. Uh, and so the execution of a script in Bitcoin is a bit longer than the creation of a script, um, but uh, we're gonna do it. Um, so I'm going to take, it's in five parts here. And so we'll pop all of this into our console and don't hit enter because there's more to it. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a transaction ID from Bitcoin Core after we've sent money to our smart contract. Uh, we're gonna take a transaction index. We're going to find out what, what address the money is in or not whatever the money's in, but where we want to send the money. Uh, we're gonna defi define all those variables. We're gonna say how much money is in the Bitcoin address, how much money is going to go to you know, Alice or Bob or whoever's winning. Uh, and then we're going to get the witness script. We're gonna get the actual script. Um, we're gonna recreate the ball game script um, because you need to recreate your script in order to spend it. Uh, okay, so that's what that part is going to do, but that's just part one. Um, the next one is part two of this. And so let's pop that in and then I'll tell you what it does. Uh, part two, rec it, recreate, it uses the witness script to recreate the Bitcoin address that has the money in it because you need to know what money, you're, what address you're spending out of. Uh, and then it creates something called an output script, which is just how Bitcoin decodes uh, a witness script and turns it into you know, something it likes. Uh, and then part three, creates something called a partially signed Bitcoin transaction. Partially signed Bitcoin transactions are a uh, a format for working with Bitcoin transactions that's created, that was designed originally for when you're gonna do multi-sig. You can use this transaction format to like pass around my signatures and you can give me yours and we can come to consensus on a transaction. Uh, in this case, we're not exactly using multi-sig, um, but it's useful anyway to just have a common standardized format for passing around um, Bitcoin transactions and signatures. So we're using it. Uh, so we're putting, every, we're putting all that information into um, PSBT format, and then we're just gonna add an output to our PSBT, which is gonna be um, Alice's address or Bob's address if he wins. So that's gonna be the output, and then we're gonna put however much money we're, he's winning we're gonna, is gonna go into there. Uh, and then we're gonna sign it. We're gonna sign it with whoever wins private key. Uh, and then lastly, the last part of this thing is called get final scripts. And the get final scripts function, um, all it does is it, it, it takes everything that's on your stack, 
uh, uses the variable unsigned integer thing to say how long everything is, uh, which it does down here, and then returns your final script. Uh, and that's all we need. Then th that'll give us a signed Bitcoin transaction right here, extract transaction, uh, that we can then broadcast to the network. Um, so that's our function. And we just hit enter, and there it is. Our function is all ready to call. Um, all we need to do now is actually send some money into that address and then withdraw it. So let's go up to our Bitcoin address. Our smart contract Bitcoin address is right here. Pull that into Bitcoin Core uh, right here. We're going to send some money to it. And we will send, how much money did I say was going to be in there? I believe I said something like 25 million sats. Um, yeah, right here. Original quantity of cents is going to be this. So we will send that amount of money into the address. And uh, we'll have a fee of one sat per byte. So, yep, we will send this in. So we've got some money in our little Bitcoin, our you know, testnet Bitcoin address. Uh, 25 million sats. And we need a couple of pieces of information from this. So show transaction details. Uh, we need to know the transaction ID and we need to know the uh, V out. So we can pop that into our function because Bitcoin needs to know these things in order to spend money. Um, so we'll just pop our transaction ID right there. And well, we need the TX index, which we can get by going into um, uh, we got its transaction ID, so I can go into my console window, open the console, and say get transaction, paste false true. Uh, and we can see in here that it is output number one. There are two outputs. We spent the change back to ourself, and we sent 25 million sats into the address. So we will take the ad index number one. Uh, and this is going to be the winner's address. Um, so all we're going to do now is call this uh, this function using our last bit of code here withdraw from ball game address and we should see a successful transaction so here's the secret this is the this is the secret that says the Packers won and then we're going to pass in Alice's priv key which we already defined earlier uh, and uh, we're going to pass in these other functions that recreate the Bitcoin address and when we do we get this we get a Bitcoin transaction and if we just copy that into Bitcoin right into our console we say uh, send raw transaction there we go we just sent that raw transaction and here's the transaction ID that moved the money over to Alice so we have created and run a Bitcoin smart contract uh, this secret is the one for if the Packers won if you want to change it you can make it that uh, we just changed the last letter to a C that is for if the Saints win and then you can have Bob uh, get the money by putting in Bob's private key here. And uh, the other thing you need to do is um, uh, instead of passing in a one that, will, that triggers the if condition, you'd pass in a zero right here. And uh, that would pass in the else condition uh, where Bob wins. Uh, and then you'd, then you'd run your script again and, and Bob would win this time. Um, but as is, we made Alice win. She won, she won the, the game. And uh, you know, ESPN would reveal uh, this secret, or you know, probably a much more secure secret for whichever team won. Um, but that's how you can build an oracle in Bitcoin. Uh, I certainly recommend. Lastly, if you want to try out more scripts, you can make your own using the ScriptWiz IDE. Um, just go and change it over to Bitcoin from Liquid, and then you can experiment away with writing Bitcoin scripts on your own. Uh, and lastly, I have my references. So in preparation for making this this course, uh, this lesson. I read Nick Zabo's Smart Contracts paper. Um, I read Andreas Antonopoulos' wonderful book, Mastering Bitcoin, which tells you how to use, excuse me, which tells you how to do all this stuff in more detail. Uh, he also has a wonderful YouTube video called Advanced Bitcoin Scripting, where he shows you how to make um, really complicated scripts similar to the ones I've done here. Uh, and then there's a Bitcoin wiki, which gives you uh, a list of all the scripts that Bitcoin, uh, all the functions Bitcoin Script has and um, what you can do with them and how they work. Uh, so all of that is more detail, but we've got three, three minutes for questions and comments. So 
Uh, let's go see if there are any. And um, yeah, does any? I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. So I was just about to say, I saw Rafa's hand up. Rafa, go for it. What's up, Rafa? Hey, super best that. Um, can you guys hear me? Thank you, James. Uh, actually, I had a, a question at the beginning. Um, if you could walk me through the, um, was it the swap, like at a high level, like the swap or the tokens mm -hmm. use case that you, I know you explained it, but like step by step, like at the high level. And this was yeah. fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. So a swap is, is the way we used to do swaps in Satoshi's day was that you'd have two blockchains. He did this on Namecoin, I think was the was like the only other blockchain when Satoshi was around was Namecoin. Uh, and so he proposed, I think this is how it worked. Um, you'd, you'd create a multi-signature Bitcoin address uh, and a multi or I forget if it was Bitcoin or Namecoin. On one of them, you'd create a multi-sig uh, and you would make it so that You'd create, a, uh, you'd create a corresponding address on the other chain where in order to spend from the address on the other chain, you would have to reveal your private key on the original chain. Uh, you'd have to like put it in as, um, as input to the script. Uh, and so then once, when you've done that, uh, by revealing your private key, it would make it so that the other person would have both private keys that he needs to take the money from the other chain, uh, to take the money from the address on the other chain. Uh, and so that's how it worked. Basically, you would just you would, you create two Bitcoin addresses. One of them would require you to to in plain text show your private key for the other chain. Uh, and once you've shown that, the other your counterparty, you know, you, you get that money. You get to spend the money by putting in your private key. But your counterparty now has both of the private keys he needs to spend the money on the other chain. So you could use that for an atomic swap. You put money in address A and address B, uh, and then if you give your private key on this chain. Uh, he gets the money on the other chain. You, you get the money on chain A, yeah. he gets the money on chain B. That's crystal clear. And then the, the, the other use case, was it like the token like token use case that you presented at the beginning? Yeah, um, well, the, ordinarily with, we, we use, we, we, there are a variety of methods for marking a Bitcoin address as special and then treating the sats in it um, as special. The latest example was ordinals, um, where we, we keep track of how early um, some Satoshis went into an address on the chain, and then that earlier addresses are special, or earlier coins are special. Um, so that's one way of doing it. We also have a function in Bitcoin called opreturn, um, and I, since I just ran out of time, I will just say you can learn more about um, creating tokens on Bitcoin, like classical ways of doing it, if you want to learn like the history of this stuff. Um, What's it called? Omni, uh, uh, yeah, Omni. Look up Omni, uh, Omni blockchain, or uh, look up Omni Bitcoin. Uh, it was an early protocol for doing this using a function in Bitcoin called op return um, to mark an address as special and then treat the sats in it as as tokens, um, uh, other to tokens other than Bitcoin. Um, yes, colored. Someone in the comment section says colored coins. Basically, yes, that was at the time they were called colored coins. Um, so that's. Classical versions of how tokens work. I, I'm sorry to say that I'm out of time. My presentation ran long and I didn't have time for questions, so sorry everybody. But it is time for the next person to present. Uh, you can reach me. You can reach out to me on Twitter. Let me put my uh, information in here. I'm on Twitter.com/supertestnet. Uh, you can also reach out to me on Telegram. On Telegram, I am supertestnet. On Discord, I am also Super test net. So, yeah, reach out to me on those, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. But uh, thank you. Let's uh, let's hear from the next gentleman now. This is beautiful. Thank you so much for this fantastic day, Super test net. This was a lot of fun. Let's uh, get a group picture real quick before you head out. So everybody, cut your cameras on, please. And let's thank Super test net for this awesome crash course. This is this was awesome. I learned a lot. All right. We're going to count backwards from three and thank Super Testnet for his return. Three, two, one. Thank, thank you, Super, Super Testnet. Thank Welcome you, back. Super thank Testnet. Super Testnet. Welcome back. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being better than my college professors. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> nice.